Today, farming is changing. It's changing every day, and the pace is quickening. In farming today, nothing is guaranteed a place, not even the pitchfork or the plow. There's not one new way to do a job, but several. And tomorrow, they may be changed again. Where you used to exchange labor, today you exchange ideas. And you exchange ideas so fast that at Alice Chalmers, we have to have men like Joe Mullins to tell us what you're going to do next. Here, Joe is talking with a farmer who's planting corn using the no-till planting system. Joe travels a wide area, riding fence rails and tractors, talking to farmers and fertilizer dealers, bankers and scientists. He talks to the people who realize that farming is changing. Those who have accepted farming's challenge of change. I think I'd be the only one curious enough to come and take a look at this idea. Anyone who plants right in corn stalks without plowing can expect an audience. I'll bet before this crop is harvested, there'll be a path ward right past here. Reminds me of one farmer near here I talked to, uh, John Scott. He tried something new and figured it saved him about one and a half man hours per acre. But he also attracted so many visitors that he spent about a thousand hours giving guided tours. Yet the uh, he told me he was glad to do it. Figured it kind of squared accounts with all the farmers who had given him a helpful tip or two. And you know what? One of those visitors was Bill here. And I'm sure he'll be glad to let you see what he's doing. This no-till poulter has really revolutionized planting for other crops and in other areas too. I've seen farmers using them to plant corn and sod. And in Kentucky and other areas of the South and Southwest, Farmers are double cropping their wheat and barley ground by planting soybeans right in the grain stubble. Some of them go in after planting and mulch the stubble to form a thick mat that holds in the moisture and smothers out the weeds. I really wish you had a chance to travel with me for a week or two and I'd show you a million new ideas in farming. This sort of thing is happening all across the country and with every crop. In fact, hardly a day goes by that I don't see or hear of something new in farming. Take tractors, for example. Uh, just 10 years ago, the biggest tractor we made was 45 horsepower. Today, our smallest tractor, the 160, is 40 horsepower. And our biggest is rated at over 130 horsepower. And it won't be long before some of you are asking for still bigger tractors. It's interesting that this emphasis on more power isn't just because of bigger farms. I talk with a lot of farmers who are operating the same number of acres they did 10 years ago. Yet. They're using twice the horsepower. And most of them give me the same reason. Adequate power lets one man do more work. And it's cheaper than operating a couple of smaller tractors. And they're right. With one eight plow tractor like the 220, it costs less for fuel and manpower than it would to run two four plow tractors. And it requires only one plow instead of two. And only one disc instead of two. Then take a look at the initial cost per horsepower. But the biggest savings can be the labor. If you're paying a man wages to operate a tractor, the price per hour is the same whether he covers one acre an hour or 10. But first you have to find him. And finding good labor these days may be the toughest job of all. So this power up for profit theory makes a lot of sense on just about any size farm. A lot of farmers tell me they're overpowering on purpose. They say it pays off when you figure what a difference or a day or two makes during a harvest or planting rush, especially under uh, any type of uh, adverse conditions. In fact, you fellows are telling me that number one consideration in buying your tractors is based on its performance. There's no substitute for power. But you know, the high torque of a turbocharged 190 XT or 220 is really the secret of their winning performance. Torque is what gets the work done. And you know, torque is what these two tractors have plenty of. A fast torque buildup and a real high torque peak. Now on small tractors that are not turbocharged, you need big displacements, like the 301 cubic inch diesel 180 or the 265 gas engine. And you'll have long life, economy, and good torque. The big displacement really makes them hang in there. That's why Ellis Chalmers tractors are really catching on since farmers became so power conscious. 
You buy a five plow tractor and you've always got five plow power because they're not overrated. Maybe you don't need a tractor as big as the 170 or 180 because of the size of your farm or the type of operation you have. So what do you look for in a small tractor? Well, the ability to do close precision work with proper speeds and hydraulics that respond to light and heavy draft loads, to mention just a few. But you also want enough big power and weight for your primary tillage work. The new 160 has a rare combination of big tractor looks, weight, and power with all the fine precision performance of the smallest tractors. Now here's what I mean. A 40 horsepower gas or diesel 160 with 10 speeds forward ranging from one half to 15 miles per hour. You have a choice of category number one or two, three point hitch. Hydraulics that respond instantly to light draft loads. A two stage engine clutch and a differential lock. This is a deluxe tractor all right with emphasis on lots of comfort and convenience. You can tell in a minute that this is a deluxe seat and so are the fenders with four headlights. How about a hood that tilts forward for easy servicing? Suitcase front weights, foot throttle, and then there are many options such as a low clearance muffler. It's deluxe all right, but it also carries a low first cost. Now to get really great performance on any Alice Chalmers tractor, you can put traction booster to work on mounted, semi-mounted, or even pull type implements. I went with one of our dealers once when he was demonstrating traction booster. He'd fixed up a meter that counted the revolutions of the rear wheels. He had the farmer plow a measured distance with the traction booster off. And then he had him disc the same distance using the traction booster. He tried that experiment three times because he just couldn't believe it would make that much difference. And he bought the tractor too. Of course, you could reduce slippage by adding extra wheel weights too. But then you'd be hauling all that extra weight around even when you didn't need it. With Traction Booster, it's there when you need it, automatically. I'm always surprised when I talk to a farmer who thinks Traction Booster only works with mounted implements. The Traction Booster drawbar isn't just a big weight you hang on the drawbar. It hooks right onto the draft arms of the three-point hitch and gives you the same Traction Booster system on a chisel plow or a disc harrow that you have with mounted equipment. And again, it's just there when you need it, automatically. Sometimes I think we have so many features on the Alice Chalmers tractors that we often forget to tell you about some of them. There's one story that one of the dealers in Ohio told me about I don't think I'll ever forget. Seems this uh, young farmer came running into the shop one morning. He was all excited because he was mounting his cultivator and he discovered quite by accident that he could change the front wheels just by removing a few bolts and uh, use the tractor power to move the wheels in or out. Well. That was one time you might think we didn't learn anything from listening to the farmer, but we did. It made us start thinking that some farmers might not be aware of a lot of the features that we put on Alice Chalmers tractors. The same features that uh, we added because the farmers asked for them. Features like uh, the power shift rear wheel. Convenience features such as the console that puts everything within easy reach of one hand. Such as the power clutch that is used for starting and stopping and shifting on the go. An adjustable steering wheel on some tractors. Big fuel tanks that keep you going all day. Platform room that you begin to appreciate before the long day ends. The little things make a difference. And it's this difference that will really make you appreciate these tractors. One of the most talked about features on a tractor is the shift on the go. Uh, many of you seem more confused about this than anything else. The question is, how do you judge which is best for you? Well. You decide this by how you use your tractor. If you use it primarily for long, steady pulls with only the normal changes in soil conditions, your primary concern is efficiency. Or in other words, the one that puts the most of the engine horsepower to the drawbar. A good example of this is a 170 that gets over 90% of its power to the drawbar, while most tractors get only 85 to 87%, and some as little as 72%. There's a big difference in the amount of work that each will do when one loses 10 to 20% of its power because of inefficiency. The power clutch can also be used to start and stop loads. And because it has a simple design, it's very efficient at getting the most power to the drawbar. A little while ago, we were talking about performance. 
If you've ever watched our tractors at a pulling contest, you know that they deliver all the horsepower that you pay for. This is one place I really get a chance to talk with a lot of farmers. And the subject they usually want to talk about is power. You couldn't find a better atmosphere for discussing the subject, especially if you're discussing Alice Chalmers' power. We've proven without a doubt that we're really in the big league for outright lugging ability. And that's what you're looking for on a plow or a chisel or any other big job. Big power pays off too when it comes to minimum tillage operation. You know, I've seen a lot of minimum tillage farming, but this has to be the ultimate. This is true no tillage farming. This term minimum tillage means a lot of things to a lot of people. It takes many forms and it's a big part of the change in farming today. Actually, if you can eliminate even one operation from the conventional method of seedbed preparation for a particular crop, you can call it minimum tillage. For some farmers I've talked to, this means eliminating intermediate tillage and planting the crop right in the fall plowed or freshly plowed ground using wheel track planting. For others, it means eliminating the plow and planting directly in the old crop residue by using no-till coulters or by combining tillage and planting into a single operation. The man who has eliminated the disc harrow from his operation can't salvage a poor plowing job with an extra disc. So he's demanding a plow that'll give him the performance he needs. He's looking for a stronger plow that'll hold the bottoms in true alignment and keep the draft light. He's looking for plenty of clearance to keep from plugging up in heavy trash. And he wants easy handling to eliminate wasted motion. But most of all, he wants a plow that'll give consistently good results, even under less than ideal conditions. The same holds true for the farmer who chooses a chisel. He wants performance. And in a chisel, that means strong shanks with controlled vibration of the teeth. It means a design that affords good trash clearance, yet gives good penetration, even on steep hillsides or sandy flatlands or heavy gumbo. And it means capacity, enough size to save time, because after all, that's half of what minimum tillage is all about. And while a disc harrow used to have an easy life just following the plow around the field, today it faces a real challenge. Where the plow has been eliminated, the disc is called on to work a lot harder. It has to have the weight to penetrate heavy sod and stubble fields, cut through heavy trash that used to be buried. It has to have the size and the strength to handle a bigger job on more acres, yet be easily adjustable to handle a variety of tillage assignments, like tearing out old beds or working under poor conditions. It seems to me that ever since it became possible to plant a crop in rough seedbed, you farmers have picked up the challenge and run wild with new ideas. And you never stop once a crop is in the ground. The changes in crop care practices are almost as revolutionary as with tillage. Take Bill's farm here. He won't be cultivating it because he's applying his pre-emergence right now. Chances are there won't be any weeds, but if there are, he'll simply spray again. He'll likely grow this corn crop with just three trips across the field. Once to plant, once to spray, and then to harvest. Chemicals have caused a big change in cultivation practices on all crops. And uh, narrow rows have promoted additional changes. The byword in weed control today seems to be, get them early. I talked to one narrow row farmer who sprays for weeds after planting, then uses a rotary hole right after the crop is done. He feels that this takes care of any grass and weeds the herbicide misses. Plus it works the chemical into the surface layer much better than incorporating a pre-plant chemical with a disc harrow. Where grass or soil crusting is a problem, I've seen many farmers use a spring tooth cultivator. In most circumstances, either a spring tooth or a rotary hole will eliminate one regular cultivation. Well, I've got to be hurrying along. I've already taken up too much of your time. I know you're all anxious to take a look at what Bill is up to here, and I've got to go talk to a group of farmers on the subject of the challenge of change in farming today. Actually, if I sounded like I was preaching a little, it's just that I was practicing up for what I want to tell those farmers tonight. But maybe some of what I've told you will convince you that going orange is going great. Well, 
So long, and thanks for listening.